Good afternoon. My name is Eva Feldman, and I'm director of the Neural Network for Emerging Therapies. Today, I want to express my gratitude to the Wolf Brain Initiative and to my colleagues in the Francis and Kenneth Eisenberg Family Depression Center and the Department of Psychiatry for joining me today in our mini symposium on protecting your brain from stress. I'm really joined by three of psychiatry's most esteemed members, Dr. Sen, Reba, and chair of the department, Dr. Dalek. So in order to really understand how we can protect the brain from stress, we really do need to understand how the brain responds initially to stress. So brain health depends on many different brain centers. And we have discussed previously the hippocampus shown in blue, which is the center for memory and learning. But today, let me introduce to you the amygdala, which is our center that helps us respond to fear, anxiety, and stress. And in an acute stress situation, the amygdala sends out signals shown here in red to different areas of the brain where chemicals known as neurotransmitters are released. And it gives us the brain response we experience with fear, stress, and anxiety. And the appropriate brain centers are activated for the responses that you incur. However, during chronic stress, what occurs is that these neurotransmitters or chemicals are blunted and the response in the brain is blunted. But what does happen is there's definitely higher inflammatory response and inflammation in the brain, more stress hormones are released, and there's less growth factors or neurotrophic factors. So chronic stress clearly affects brain health, brain chemistry, and brain inflammation. Today, what our symposium will address are three things. First, Dr. Sun will examine the prevalence of stress and the relationship of genes to depression. Secondly, Dr. Reba will outline for us stress managing strategies that enhance our well being and brain health. And finally, we're going to have a panel where Dr. Dalek will join Drs. Reba and Sen, and we will answer your questions on stress. I'm very pleased now to turn the podium over to my good friend and esteemed colleague, Dr. Sen. Thank you so much, Dr. Feldman, for uh, inviting me and for all your support over the years. And thanks so much for uh, choosing this as a topic. I, I think this um, stress and the brain is, is such an important topic and it's really a major focus of the, of the Eisenberg Family Depression Center, which I'm fortunate enough to direct. Um, I think the pandemic has really highlighted for all of us how important our, our mental health and well-being are and how many different parts of our lives and um, society really affect our, our mental health and well-being um, from our physical health to social connections to our schools and um, workplaces and, and how much we're sleeping and, and exercising. And, um, and it's also highlighted how far we have to go and how much work we, we need to do to come up with really new and innovative approaches to both treating um, depression and other mental health problems and also setting up our, our culture and our society to, to prevent them and to help us stay well. And, and that's one of the, the areas we're really focusing on um, in the depression center. We've, we're fortunate enough to get a wonderful gift from the Eisenberg family and support from Michigan Medicine. And, and I'm really excited about the progress we're making in bringing together a lot of the, the really brilliant researchers and innovators across Michigan and bringing in some new world-class experts to our university to help work collectively towards these goals and improving improving our lives. And I, I'd love you to learn more on our website or, or contact me and talk more, more with any of you about this. Um, one of the areas we've, we're focusing on and, and the own research is trying to understand the relationship between stress and depression. And, um, and how stress leads to depression in different ways in different people. And today I'll focus a, a lot on, on the roles, the genes and what we inherit from our, our parents and our families, how, how that plays a role in, in stress and depression. A lot of my research stems from, from one study and, and one study of a, of a specific 
um, a somewhat unusual population, but one that I hope we can learn more broadly about all of us from, and that's that's um, interns. Um, these are these are training doctors in their first years as professional doctors, and this is the year when people first get to the hospital and first have real responsibility. Um, are working, you know, 70, 80 hours a week and not getting enough sleep and dealing with life and death situations. So it's a really stressful time. And it's an unusual situation because it's a, it's a relatively rare time where we can predict that a group of relatively healthy, well-adjusted people will experience a stress and we can follow them as they go through it. So we've been doing this study for about 15 years now and have enrolled about 25,000 of these first year doctors. Um, both at Michigan and at 100 hospitals around the country and in China and Africa and, and a few other places around the world. Um, we follow them um, uh, in the spring right after they match into, into different residency programs and, and characterize them in, in a few different ways. Um, we give them, uh, we get their DNA, we give them Fitbits to track their sleep and steps and things like that. And then we follow them as they go through their year and, and encounter these stressors. Um, before the year starts, um, when the interns are, are relatively stress-free, about 4% of them are depressed, meet criteria for depression, which is, or at least was before the pandemic, about the rate in the general population. But within a, a few months, by September of their intern year, about 25% of them are depressed, and, and they stay, um, they cycle in and out of depression um, at an alarmingly high rate um, during the year. About half of interns have at least one episode of depression during the year. So the rates are really high and, and increase a lot with, with this internship stress. And it's not just sort of the symptoms or feelings they have or, or, or things that they report on a, on a questionnaire. Um, we can see the effects of the stress that they're feeling and experiencing get under the skin and, and affect them on a, on a cellular level. Um, telomeres are uh, uh, the caps that we have at the end of all of our chromosomes, and, and they reliably get shorter as we get older at a, at a predictable rate. And as we get into older age, um, they're really strong predictors of other diseases of aging. Um, so on an average year, our, our telomeres shorten about 25 base pairs um, a, a unit each, each year. Um, when we looked at interns, we found that interns during that stressful one year of training their telomeres shortened about 150 base pairs, so six times as much as we'd expect. And we saw a lot of variation within the interns. So the ones who were working really hard, working 75 or more hours um, uh, each week had an even greater uh, decrease in their telomere. So from a cellular level, it's like these guys are coming in as, as 27 year olds, but instead of leaving as 28 year olds, they're really leaving as, as, uh, as 33 year olds, they're, they're having uh, acceleration in their cellular aging. In addition to telomeres, we can also look at the genetic sequence, and there's been real progress in the last um, five to eight years or so in identifying specific genetic variations across our genome that um, each have a really small but, but significant association with your risk for depression. Um, and with that, we can add up that across all 20 million sites across our genome and come up with a polygenic score. This is the type of score that you get for depression or diabetes or heart high, high blood pressure um, from 23andMe or other sites like that. When people are sort of in that middle of that score distribution, they have an average risk of getting depression. If they're on the left side, a relatively low risk and on the right side, a relatively high risk. And we can apply that score to different populations and, and we can apply it to the interns to learn a little bit more about how the genetics is acting. Um, this is a, a, a little complex slide, so I'll talk you through it, but uh, you can see across the bottom of the, the graph is the person's score for uh, their polygenic score for depression. And the lower line, the, the green line, uh, is people before internship, so under low stress. And you can see there is a little bit of a relationship there. People at higher risk on the right side um, have a little bit higher depression, but it's a pretty... Um, uh, low slope and, and not that strong of a relationship. What we see with the interns is that in the context of stress, when people are under stress, the relationship between the genes and depression is much stronger. So on the upper line, people um, with higher polygenic scores have much higher depression than people with, with middle polygenic scores. And you could see on the left side of the graph, people with very low polygenic risk scores almost never get depressed during internship. So we can see the relationship between genes and depression get stronger under stress. 
And the, a, a line of work I'm really excited about is that we can start to use this genetics to understand how, how it's working and how different um, people are, have different susceptibilities to different types of stress or different risk factors. Um, one of the first ones we've been looking at is, is social stress and social support. Um, in this graph, we broke down people, the genetics into people with um, a low polygenic risk for depression in the lighter line that's dotted and higher risk for depression in the darker line um, that's solid. And on the left side of the graph, um, uh, you can see um, people when they're losing a lot of social support or have very little social support. And, and the relationship is, as you'd expect, the people with high polygenic risk for depression have much higher depression than people with low polygenic risk. But as we move across the graph to people who are experiencing more and more social support um, and in towards the right side of the graph, a really robust social support, you can actually see the relationship flips that people who we thought were at high polygenic risk for depression actually have lower depression and much lower depression than people um, uh, than people with low polygenic risk. So you can see that this, what we thought was a polygenic risk for depression is actually just um, sensitivity to social support in this case. And, and if you put people in good social environments, um, then they actually thrive. Um, whereas if they're in bad social environments, they, they struggle. And, and so it seems to be um, indexing the, the sensitivity to social support. So as we saw with uh, um, social support, we're, we're able to expand this work to look at a, a series of different factors um, that capture the risk factors we're looking at for depression and, and um, related traits. Um, just like we saw with social support that the higher polygenic risk for depression um, index sensitivity to social support, we see similar relationship between the polygenic risk for depression and uh, physical activity and exercise where people with low polygenic risk for depression are relatively resistant to um, the effects of exercise. They, they have similar mood and depression, whether they get um, high amounts of activity or low amounts of activity, but people with high polygenic risk are, are sensitive. And when they don't get enough physical activity, they have uh, a, a high risk for low mood and for depression. We can also um, look at this relationship with, um, with other traits, um, uh, the one I've listed here is, is chronotype or, or uh, predisposition to being a morning person or an evening person. And we can see that people with a high polygenic risk score for chronotype, people who uh, tend to be more evening people are sensitive to the duration of their sleep, um, how, how long they're sleeping, um, but not as sensitive to the, the timing of their sleep. Um, and, and through this, we can look at the relationship between uh, a whole set of genomic profiles and risk factors and hopefully get to the place where we can get a more personalized sense of, of who is sensitive to these different factors that can predispose to depression and, and why they are. And, and as we gather that information, get to the point where we have a much more personalized approach to, uh, uh, to treating and, and, and particularly for preventing depression. Uh, so I took you through a, a whirlwind of different um, findings, but I hope gave a sense of, of where we are in depression research and, and in understanding the different factors and how stress can, can lead to depression. And a glimpse at hopefully the future of a more personalized and, and uh, effective approach in, in, in treating depression, both at an individual level and, and, um, and as we approach it in, from a more cultural and, and societal point of view. So. Um, thank you for listening, and now I'll pass it along to my colleague, Dr. Riva. Thank you, Dr. Sen, for that kind introduction. I'd like to thank the Eisenberg family for their continued support, and Dr. Eva Feldman and her uh, wonderful uh, staff for uh, their help in organizing the symposium, and to all of you for being here today. Uh, it's been a very stressful couple of years and it still remains quite stressful. Um, stress is inescapable. So today what we're going to be talking about is how to recognize the emotions, the varied emotions that are associated with stress and how to uh, take control of stress, um, both by cognition and by our activities. We've learned over the last couple of years what has helped and what hasn't helped both individually and as a community. 
Um, we've learned, for example, that kids need to be in school and there are a lot of associated services that schools have that kids aren't able to get or haven't been able to get while they're home. We've learned that uh, being in nature is, and with others is, is, is a good way to exercise. Um, clubs are important and hobbies. It's good to have more than one in case some, uh, one of them shuts down during um, a difficult time like we've had during the pandemic. It's been so unusual, but yet it's good to have um, uh, not be so dependent on just one or two things. We've missed some of our sporting events. About a third of us have missed medical or dental appointments, and that's been very stressful, M missing like, for example, mammograms or uh, laboratory work. Um, moving has been very important and, and connected to depression. If people are depressed, they're not moving so much, their sleep has been impacted, they overeat or don't eat in a healthy way, they drink too much. And so it's like a vicious cycle. And so it's important from a physical and emotional point of view to move. Many of us, myself included, have been too much on screen time. And while it's been fun to watch our children and grandchildren do some TikToks, it's also been difficult to watch our children being glued and not moving and, and um, being bullied or, or being defriended on, on Facebook and other media. And how to, uh, how to change that is something our, all of our families have to address. Um, it's affected relationships. Many of us go to our computers, our studies and sit there for hours at a time. Instead, what we should be talking about and helping each other with is uh, learning new things, reading, uh, doing puzzles like Wordle, for example, uh, um, mindfulness, meditation, uh, yoga are all um, really good stress busters. So um, that is something that really all of us should be thinking about and uh, working on. Uh, guilt is an important uh, problem to have. And as we come out of this COVID-19 pandemic, many of us want to start to travel and see friends and family, um, go, and go to restaurants. There may be still some people who are immunocompromised, have health issues, and with a mask mandate coming down, we really need to talk to our friends and family about what's the best approach to all this um, and be open and honest about it. And if somebody does get COVID, uh, the Omicron variant or other variants in the future, it's important to not beat ourselves or blame ourselves, but just help one another. In families, we've ne negotiated, uh, you know, who should do what. Uh, many of us have been trying to uh, shift, well, uh, you know, responsibilities uh, and, um, uh, and doing things like laundry. I know for myself that I have tie-dyed towels and uh, underwear and um, moving forward, how should we negotiate the new normal in our families? Um, we're all two years older. Uh, our children, grandchildren may be asking for help and support. Childcare is gonna be di uh, different. Uh, people have changed jobs, lost jobs. Uh, moving back to homes um, where people and neighbors might have uh, also changed their uh, residences. So we all have to think about and coordinate and uh, think about the future together. Many of us have had uh, motions over the last two years that have been sort of bottled up and we want to acknowledge this in a safe way. Uh, some of us have lost friends or family and so there's a lot of sadness where we're going to have to um, uh, talk about memorial services and proper um, services for, for the loved ones. Um, it's been very traumatic for many people, especially young people. Um, and uh, many of us have been enraged, angry, feeling lonely, deserted. Um, we don't wanna pathologize necessarily these emotions. We don't wanna make you feel like you have to be therapists, um, but it's important to, to at this time take stock of where we're all feeling. And we may need help doing that, uh, talking, asking each other how we're feeling, how we're doing and, and taking the, having a conversation about this with each other and um, uh, trying to get, point people in the right direction for support and help will be the way to go. 
And if people do need help, there are therapists and others available. Connecting with others is important and um, Zoom has been great and I appreciate you being on Zoom today, but it doesn't substitute for being together, doing things together. It's much more fun, it's much more invigorating, but there may be people out there who because of their health conditions are not ready yet to get together. And so everybody's on a different timeline. We have to be respectful of that. Um, and there may be some stress in coming together, in fact. So uh, heading that off, thinking about it, recognizing that people are at different uh, uh, timelines here for getting connected will be important and serving the community. I know that many of you already have done so much in serving your community in many different ways and the University of Michigan, for that we are so grateful. But there may be now opportunities for you. you maybe you're thinking about different ways or maybe you've, you've thought about during COVID or with the political crises in Russia and Ukraine, how you might wanna serve the, the local or greater community in different ways. Maybe your children or grandchildren are now ready to to uh, to to want to be with you as you serve. So it might be invigorating. It might be stressful and changing how you've been doing things, but um, really um, an opportunity to make some changes, perhaps in your life, would would be would, would be uh, welcome. So in summary, lots of different ways to, in the short term and the long term, deal with stress. It's important to look at the emotions associated with stress, give each other grace, uh, appreciation, humor, especially to yourselves and your loved ones, and, and really try to connect and serve your community in the best way po possible. So thank you so much, and I look forward to the conversation with you. Well, I want to thank um, our uh, speakers, and I'm very pleased to say I'm now joined also by uh, Dr. Gregory Dalek, who is a professor of psychiatry. So we were submitted about 40 questions and I've picked uh, 20 for uh, our panel to answer. I do realize possibly we'll go past the 2.30 hour, maybe by five to 10 minutes, but please, for those of you who have joined us and need to log off at 2.30, we understand. The questions are so good though. Uh, that I really want to try to address many of them. So thank our speakers, beautiful talks. And again, I'd like to thank the Wolf family for sponsoring the mini symposium and so pleased to welcome all our colleagues from the Eisenberg Depression Center. And on that note, Dr. Dalek, let me start with you. Um, and several questions have focused on uh, stress and disease. So what diseases are induced or accelerated by stress and how does stress impact the quality of life? Thank you. Well, first of all, let me just thank you, Dr. Feldman, for the opportunity to participate in this uh, symposium with my colleagues and thank all of you who have attended and have supported both this symposium and the University of Michigan in so many ways. Um, I, I would just wanna start out by reminding us that stress uh, has a, an advantage for us in some situations, right? Uh, the idea that in certain circumstances, we need to mobilize our um, both physical and emotional resources to respond to a demand is part of what stress is. The problem is if the stress is ongoing, chronic, relatively unremitting, then it has uh, many more negative consequences for us. And um, the list of illnesses that are worsened by chronic stress is very long. You've heard about the impact of stress on depression and mood disorders. I'm sure you know about the impact of, of uh, stress on heart disease, um, on almost any disease you can think of, uh, um, uh, musculoskeletal conditions as well, um, uh, obesity, uh, and sometimes stress results in coping skills that are not terribly constructive. So many people will smoke or smoke more heavily or drink or drink more heavily in response to stress, and that has its own health consequences. So the idea is that we're brought up here about finding other ways to deal with stress, to offload some of that chronic stress are very important. Activities, as Dr. Reba spoke about, mindfulness um, sorts of practices uh, on our own are helpful as well. And for those that, for whom stress um, ultimately manifests in 
uh, an episode of depression or other kinds of psychiatric conditions, getting treatment for those uh, is also critical, can be very helpful. Thank you. Um, I'll go to Dr. Sen now. And uh, many questions that are very relevant to what you do, but let me ask this one. What is known about the role of exercise in reducing stress? Certainly Dr. Reba mentioned it, but does it affect our genetics? You know, what, what is your thought on exercise and stress, please? Yeah, a great question. And, and uh, Dr. Reba um, covered some important material related to it. I think exercise is one of our most underappreciated and probably underutilized tools to um, combat stress and, and really set up lifestyles that prevent um, the onset of depression, anxiety, and, and really the broad range of stress-related um, disorders that Dr. Dalek covered. Uh, I think uh, there's, there's really good evidence that, that exercise um, profoundly reduces our risk for stress-induced disorders and depression, particularly um, in a preventative way, and also pretty good evidence that it, it's helpful in treating it once we are um, uh, depressed, and usually not on its own, but as a part of a broader strategy. And I think I, um, some of the data I showed, I think we're still in the early days, but it really does seem like exercise interacts with, with our genetics in, in, in interesting ways. And some of us might be more, uh, um, sensitive to the effects of exercise and particularly the effects of not exercising. And I think one of the broader lessons, um, from my work and broadly is, is trying to understand ourselves and our own vulnerabilities and, uh, to different types of stress. And, and if, if you're the type of person that, um, is really at risk of, of, of a low mood or irritability or depression when you don't exercise, then prioritizing exercise is important. That's excellent. Uh, so Dr. Reeve, uh, how does one move on from a stressful situation? Yeah, that's an excellent question. So, um, so there are issues that I would like to talk about with the person who's asking this. For example, what is the stressful situation? You know, we know that there are some extremely stressful situations uh, and losses that people have to endure, like loss of a child or a divorce or loss of a, of a partner or spouse. The other question he, here is, what does moving on mean? You know, what is the person really trying to do? And some of the issues are whether there are some internal issues about that or external. Are there family issues or demands that are keeping somebody, for example, from moving or going to a new job? Or there's some internal issues about wanting to stay close and being, you know, uh, fearful of going away. And so, so this would be an ongoing conversation. Uh, also, what has the person done in the past with stressful situations and coping mechanisms? You know, how, how is the person functioning now? Um, are there other stresses besides the major stress, uh, but uh, as Dr. Dalek mentioned before, any physical problems or medical conditions that are also factors here? So, you know, this would be an ongoing conversation, but the goal would be to find out what, what and how to measure if you get there, if you're able to move on, what, what does that mean for the person? Because that's really what we're trying to do, get the person back to functioning and getting back to a life that you know is meaningful. Okay, I'm gonna do one more round at least and then maybe I'll answer one, one last question. But uh, Dr. Dalek, um, how is transcranial magnetic stimulation looking for the future uh, treatment of stressful yeah, or disorders, anxiety disorders? I think you're muted, Greg. I am, and I apologize for that. Uh, th that's a great question. Let me just uh, say a brief word about what transcranial magnetic stimulation is and then talk about where it's used. So this is a non-invasive procedure where a large magnet is uh, uh, placed near uh, the, the head and sends magnetic fields through the scalp, um, the cranium into the brain. And with newer magnets, 
can get to somewhat deeper uh, areas of the brain with the idea that by inducing a magnetic field in those brain areas, for those of you who remember your high school physics, the magnetic field can induce uh, electrical um, uh, movement, movement of electrons and activate or deactivate circuits of the brain, depending on the frequency of the magnetic stimulation. And this has been applied most successfully in depression, where our understanding of the brain circuits that are involved with depression is growing. Um, so a lot more to learn, but it's growing. And there's evidence that by stimulating certain areas or deactivating other areas, you can improve uh, an individual's mood um, if they um, have a, a period of depression, particularly one that may not have responded to traditional medication treatment. TMS um, is now being applied in other disorders, and there's some evidence for it being helpful in obsessive compulsive disorder. It's probably not the most effective treatment for that. Medication and behavioral therapy still remain the gold standard, but as an augmentation strategy, TMS, again, applied two areas of the brain where we think uh, um, um, abnormal activity occurs that is correlated with OCD uh, allows for some mitigation of those symptoms. Thank you. You know, now might be a time where I'll answer one question, only that it goes along with what you just discussed, Dr. Gallick, Gallick and that there are several questions about can't does stress really actually change brain chemistry, which I briefly introduced at the beginning, but does it change connections in the brain? And the, and the answer to that is yes. So not only does stress, does uh, chronic stress change our brain chemistry, the, how much of these brain chemicals or neurotransmitters we secrete, uh, whether there's evidence of neural inflammation in the brain that occurs with stress that's been well shown. But, if, but studies using what is known as functional MRI, where you actually look at connections in real time as a, pair, uh, as a patient or a person who's in the MRI scanner, shows that chronic stress changes brain connections, just as Dr. Kipak has alluded to. So that when you're talking about combating chronic stress, one needs to talk about you know, engaging in activities that can actually help reform new brain connections and change existing ones. So exercise is an example of something that actually helps you form new brain connections, something we've discussed previously in this mini symposium. So it goes along with what Dr. Dalek is saying about using transcranial magnetic stimulation in terms of changing how our brain connects, because it's just a bunch of wires firing all of the time. So Dr. Sen, your turn. Okay, I've got many questions for you. They're also interesting. This is one. Do you think pessimism was selected by evolution as a protective, as a protective device for survival? That's a great question. Yeah. I, about that. Um, I mean, I think uh, that's a really good question. And broadly, I think the um, uh, there's been really good work at Michigan on this area on, on why we have a capacity for getting from an evolution perspective for getting depressed and, and low mood and, and what the um, origins, what, why, especially given the high rates of, of depression and anxiety. Um, and I think uh, some of the work I presented touches on that a little bit in showing that some of the genetic background that that predisposes to depression in, in bad environments actually makes us um, healthier and, and do better and less depressed in good environments. And, and, and that, that could get a little bit at the genetic background. I think, um, I think from a specifically on pessimism and, and maybe in interpreting things in, in ways that are scary, I think anxiety is probably the easiest connection for that. And, and, um, hearing, you know, in, in ancestral societies, maybe hearing a sound and immediately jumping that that might be a lion is, um, you can see the evolutionary benefit of that. It makes sense to run away every time you think that happens, um, even if it's only a lion one out of a hundred times, but that same instinct and that same um, tendency to interpret things in the most pessimistic way um, in our current society can be, um, can be harmful and can predispose to, to anxiety and depression. So I think, 
Um, and, and a lot of our therapies and cognitive behavioral therapy and other things can help us to understand if our titrating of the level of optimism and pessimism is wrong and help get us to the, the healthiest state and, and healthiest for the environment we live in. But a, a great question and a great way to look at um, the, the sorts of disorders we're talking about today. Definitely. Thank you. So, Dr. Reba, this is a very, uh, I think, important question. How to support a loved one dealing with extreme stress from afar? Yeah, that is a good question. And I, I guess it, the answer is it's very hard to do that, both if somebody's living close or in the same household or even far. But uh, the question's about um, being far away. I, I think the, <clears throat> the two buckets are really practical and emotional and you know how, how, to, how to serve um, those two principles best. If we ask the loved one, often they don't tell us what they need, not because they don't want to, but it, it's just very difficult. And so trying to ask first, but then also to speak with people who, who are, have boots on the ground there um, might be very helpful and thinking about uh, and problem solving some practical issues that might be needed. You know, whether it's meals or extra help uh, for showering, functionality, transportation, you know, child care, some of those things could could be sort of worked through with with financial support or just trying to problem solve. The emotional issues are, I think, a little bit harder, much harder to do so far away. And, you know, that could be with, you know, we, we now have Zoom, FaceTime, calls, emails, texts, uh, notes, um, maybe some trips every once in a while, um, you know, to, to see one another, um, and talking about how difficult it is and, and um, you know, asking what might be useful, but it is hard and, you know, getting support for yourself would be very important, you know, trying to, to, to to, to deal with that uh, emotionally yourself. Thank you. Um, I'm going to only ask one more question, but before I'll close after the last question, uh, I want to encourage individuals whose questions I was not able to ask to please feel free to contact me and I will get an answer uh, to your question because there's some, I mean, there's questions that range from blue blockers to supplements. I, there's wonderful questions. So please contact me and we will ensure that we'll get your question answered. But I guess the last question will go to the chair of the Department of Psychiatry. And uh, it's, it's a really, it's a good one. I've been in a profession for 40 years, which is very stressful. Is it possible to fully counteract all of that stress? So it's kind of a nice way to end yeah. the symposium today. And I think it's a great question. I'm sure many people on this call maybe would have this, a similar question, whether it's 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. And so could you address that, Dr. Dalek? I, I will I'll do my best. Uh, so I, I think um, there's a sense in which, uh, as we get older, um, we accumulate um, experiences and we uh, take some hits to our system. Some of those can be reversed. Some of them probably can't be, but what we can do is stop the further progression by uh, interventions that reduce our stress. Um, whether you can totally, un I, I, maybe I'm reflecting too much on my own personal experience, <laughs> you can totally undo the stresses you've accumulated over a 40 year career. Um, I, I, I'm not sure I'm that optimistic about that, but whether you can pivot and focus on things that give you pleasure, restore uh, a sense of meaning in a different way and allow you to prevent the um, the further advancement of the impact of, of negative stress on you, I think is very possible and very important. Um, some of the stress for some people is moving away from something that was their identity for so many years. So finding something that they can embrace that's important to them, gives them a sense of meaning, has an impact in the way they want, can be incredibly restorative uh, in, in many ways. I thank you for that question. Well, let me end by uh, thanking my colleagues at the Eisenberg Family Depression Center and the Department of Psychiatry. It's really been a pleasure to work with the three of you, not only just for this mini symposium, but you know, throughout the years. And uh, we here at Michigan Medicine would like to thank everyone who's listened 
this afternoon and please reach out to us. We're very here for you. Okay, goodbye and have a nice afternoon.